Hey, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great introduction, but next year, if you do it again, I hope I can be the Renaissance man next year. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, it's, great to be, uh, it's, it's great to be here again, and thanks especially to all of you all for coming out tonight in the uh, snow and cold. Uh, and, and thanks as well to our sponsors, uh, RMD Davis, Uni Foundation, the Portland Public Library, the World Affairs Council, and the Rockport Public Library. This, as Peter said, is the ninth time Tom and I have delved into some aspect of uh, an upcoming Camden conference. A hundred years in a hundred minutes, it was originally. Tonight, it's a relatively short 56 years, still a hundred minutes. I remember once we did a thousand years, that was Roman history, uh, though for the life of me I can't remember, what I can't remember is what a thousand years in the history of ancient Rome had to do with the Camden Conference topic that year. Or, or anyway, what the topic was. It what? <laughs> or what the topic or was. Or what the yeah. topic was. <laughs> anyway, this year, uh, the uh, tie-in between the Camden Conference topic and what we're going to talk about is, is, is I think, uh, reasonably obvious. In ten, in 10 days or so, unless you, as Peter said, unless you forgot to get your ticket early enough since it's now sold out, you'll be hearing about where Putin's Russia is heading. Georgia, the Crimea, Eastern Ukraine. Uh, are, the Balkans, are the Baltics going to be next? Things are, are looking bleak in our world, and that's without getting uh, into the, crueling, uh, the cruelly collapsing Middle East. But look what was going on in our world exactly 100 years ago today. This is February 13th, 1915. That's the front page of the New York Times. What was just cut out were the articles that were not about the World War I battlefields. So maybe things aren't so bad today after all. Now, we don't want to be contrarian, of course, uh, but Tom and I are going to review a period of an earlier resurgent Russia beginning with the rule of a liberalizing, forward-looking czar, a little bit different than the one they have today, determined to bring his country into the modern world, and that ended a little over half a century later with the total collapse of Russia's resurgent 300-year-old system. As Max says, the, uh, our show this year is from 1861 to 1917, but in the way of a prologue, I'd like to take you back to one seminal year that occurs before that. The year uh, is 1848, and so many of the themes that come to dominate the rest of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th are first announced in 1848, that it's worth uh, pausing for a second to consider them. For instance, it was the year that Marx and Engels published the Communist Manifesto, which advocated worldwide revolution uh, and so that when the actual re rebellions of 1848 uh, started to break out, uh, first in Paris and then, and then everywhere else in, uh, in Central Europe, uh, I'm sure that Marx felt uh, that uh, this is it. This is, in California terms, this is the big one. Uh, 25 revolutions in all, 25. Uh, at the end of 1848, uh, all of Central Europe was in flames. At the end of 1849, it was all over. All of the old regimes were back in place, well, except for France, and that takes another four years before you're back to uh, the regular regime. Uh, wh why did all the rebellions fail? Well, it's easy to rebel against something. It's much harder uh, to put something in its place that's better uh, than what you've rebelled against, uh, and they weren't ready for that. Not in 1848. They needed a plan, uh, and as we'll see, it's only a revolution with a real plan behind it for something to replace uh, the uh, existing revolution that actually, the existing s system that actually succeeds. The new kid on the block in 1848 is nationalism. Uh, nationalism, uh, it hasn't found its voice yet, uh, but it is, uh, it is enabler for a homogeneous area, for instance, Germany, which is made up of 39 kingdoms and uh, grand duchies uh, in 1848. Uh, nationalism, the effects of nationalism and the revolutions in particular that broke out in places like uh, Dresden uh, and Bavaria uh, eventually transformed, uh, 30 years later, transformed Germany uh, into the united Germany we know. Uh, Italy, similarly, uh, in 1848, there, there are nationalistic revolutions going on everywhere, uh, but Italy is still, as Metternich had famously said, uh, not a nation but a geographic 
uh, expression. Italy is a mere geographic expression in 1848, uh, but in 1871, uh, it has been transformed uh, <laughs> into a single unified nation that we all know and love. Homogeneous areas uh, are uh, unified uh, by nationalism, uh, but heterogeneous areas, and in particular empires, uh, tend not to be. Uh, what happens with an empire, uh, because it's got so many different nationalities, the uh, Austrian Empire, for instance, uh, when they issue, now I'm getting ahead, ahead of the story a little bit, when they issue the mobilization order, they have to issue it in 18 different languages because uh, there are all these fault lines, national fault lines, uh, that eventually are going to tear this apart on strictly nationalistic uh, terms uh, and leave poor Austria once uh, the, the most powerful nation in the world, uh, leave it a tiny uh, second-rank nation, uh, which is what it is, uh, third-rank nation, which was what it is today. 1848 was also the year that Darwin was finishing up The or Origin of the Species. Uh, he hadn't published it yet, that happens 10 years later, but he's begun to distribute uh, pen uh, pencil sketches, 37-page sketches, uh, and he gives them to all of his scientific colleagues. They're quickly spread around the scientific community. So Hooker has a copy, Lyle has a copy, Wallace has a copy, Huxley has a copy, and they're all passing them around. Everybody's reading Huxley, uh, and they're buzzing about it. A few years before, a similar peak into uh, the revolution that was in their midst uh, uh, intellectual revolution, uh, came in the form of a book by Robert Chambers. It was called The Natural History of Creation, uh, and it asserts uh, that the Earth is not 6,000 years old, but is millions or hundreds of millions of years old. And this book is a bestseller. This, everybody's reading this. Victoria and Albert read this book. They take turns reading this book out loud to each other uh, in bed. Uh, they, declined, <laughs> they declined to have their picture taken, well, we asked, but you know, in bed. Uh, but Chambers is a rock star. He's invited uh, to give the keynote address of the British Association for the Advancement uh, of Science. And Darwin uh, and the rest of the uh, scientific elite uh, of, uh, uh, of England travel to Oxford to hear uh, Chambers speak. He gives a startling talk in which he introduces the thought that we do not need divine intervention to explain most of what goes on in the world. For instance, we don't need the hand of God to explain how the Alps got, were raised because there's magnostatic pressures underneath it, uh, magmastatic, that push the Alps up, that geological, natural geological processes explain the Earth as we see it today. The record is written in the rock. Uh, and he introduces a term which is later associated more with Darwin, uh, the idea of a self-regulating universe. All of the scientists that Sunday crowd into Oxford, Oxford Cathedral where the empire strikes back. Uh, the Lord Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, uh, Lord Bishop of Oxford, uh, gives a stinging rebuttal to Chambers. Uh, it's called the wrong way to do science. Uh, and one of the things he takes particular exception to is this notion of the self-regulating universe, an idea, he says, that is so insidious, and this is the worst thing he could say about it, so insidious that no gentleman would stoop to suggest it. No gentleman. <laughs> well, what's so upsetting, what's so threatening about a self-regulating universe? Uh, it, kind, it doesn't mean God is dead, but it means you know, he, may be, he may, may have wandered away. He may not, may not be totally engaged. It's not a God that you could say, uh, not a sparrow falls to the earth that he doesn't know about it, uh, because things are you know, more or less taking care of themselves. And that, you know, that deals an, an all, a fatal, a near fatal blow to a concept near and dear uh, to politicians everywhere, the idea that one nation uh, is chosen of God. The Jews were uh, chosen of God in the Bible, but so is everybody else. Uh, the Germans, Gott mit uns, uh, the Russians. I love this. God is with us. Bear that in mind, you heathens, and submit, for God is with us. Uh, or... Uh, uh, John Winthrop, the Americans uh, that, w that view themselves as a shining city on a hill, windswept, uh, and God blessed. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a non-interventionist God, a self-regulating universe, and, and 
I mean, if there's a self-regulating universe, the idea of national exceptionalism seems kind of silly. And, and similarly, if you believe that, you know, American is an exception, if you believe in American exceptionalism, uh, then you can't really believe in a Darwinism or a self-regulating uh, universe, which is why uh, in 2012, eight out of eight Republican candidates professed uh, not to believe in evolution. Eight out of eight. Uh, eight out of eight. So, the self-regulating universe makes national exceptionalism seem silly, uh, and I'm particularly charmed by the British notion uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, exceptionalism, uh, which is summed up in a hymn that, uh, that uh, the Brits sing every Sunday at chapel, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountain green, and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen. Jesus in England. How about that? <laughs> Eat your heart out, Belgium and Italy, because when Jesus took off from his important work for a little vacation, he didn't go to your place. He went to England, right? So, now, 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 the Brits are sophisticated people. They don't, they don't buy any of this, right? Well, I don't know. In, uh, in the summer, every summer, uh, the London Philharmonic puts on uh, a symphony which is called the Proms. Uh, and the last number of the Proms is Jerusalem. And I want you to watch uh, what the audience does when it catches the theme of Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, Darwin doesn't make uh, uh, national exception go, go away. He makes it seem kind of silly, though. Kinda, they, you have to be kind of sheepish to do that. Uh, and, uh, but one aspect of national, uh, national exceptionalism uh, does die out with, uh, the, the, with Darwinism and the, re the notion of the, of, uh, the self-regulating universe, and that is divine right monarchy. Uh, that has, that has becomes uh, an anachronism, and that's a problem because in Europe, in Germany alone, there are no fewer than 30 uh, divine right monarchs, and here they are uh, at their annual, their annual meeting in Frankfurt in 1852. Um, if we look at the map of Europe uh, at, at the period, these are the divine right monarchies in 1848. Uh, and these are the divine right monarchies in 1900, one, count them, one, and it's Russia. Uh, let me sum up the themes of 1848 that are going to be relevant here. Uh, nationalism is the genie that will not be put back in the bottle. Uh, it's hell on empires. Uh, the uh, rebelling is easy, but in order to replace the, uh, what you're rebelling against with something, you need a, a real plan. And so a, a revolution that succeeds is going to have to have uh, a theory of what to replace it with. And finally, Darwinism and the self-regulating uh, self universe make divine right uh, rule a simple anachronism. And how does that play out uh, for Russia? That's what we're here to find out. Okay, <clears throat> now far and away the most progressive czar of the 19th century was Alexander II. <clears throat> he was famous and rightly so for freeing the serfs. Now, serfs is really a misnomer. They were slaves. They could be bought and sold and rented out by their masters. Freeing the serfs wasn't the only progressive thing uh, Tsar Alexander did. He instituted trial by jury and permitted what was almost unthinkable in autocratic Russia, a free press. Alexander freed Russia's slaves March 3, 1861, two years before Lincoln issued his own Emancipation Proclamation, and quite coincidentally, the same day that Lincoln was sworn in as our 16th president. In those days, <clears throat> Russia had a population of 67 million. About a third, 23 million, were serfs, similar to the percentage of slave to free that existed in our southern states at that time as well. But here the similarity ends. Lincoln freed our slaves because of our civil war. The Russian Civil War, half a century later, one could almost say was the end result of Russia's freeing their slaves. When Alexander inherited his empire in 1855 from his father, Nicholas I, uh, who uh, incidentally died in bed, which in those days was not a, 
mean accomplishment for a Russian czar. Alexander had already made up his mind to free the serfs. Both his uncle, Alexander I, and his father, the decidedly autocratic Nicholas, were aware that at some point the serfs had to be freed. As early as 1839, the chief of the royal guards had written in a report to the czar that, quote, serfs were a cellar full of gunpowder under the state. His father, Tsar Nicholas, had earlier banned the sale of individual serfs without their families, but had gone no further. No doubt believing, as a European diplomat said at the time, and, and this is the other side of the coin to the belief that continued serfdom was a ticking time bomb. Giving the Russian serf freedom, this diplomat said, is like giving wine to a man who has never had alcohol. He will go mad. But Alexander arrived on the throne a liberal, determined to free them. When he announced to his assembly of nobles before his coronation, I've decided to do it, gentlemen, to free the serfs, he explained, if we don't free them from above, they will free themselves from below. But first he had to wind up the Crimean War, <clears throat> started doing Nicholas's reign, which Russia had lost decisively. Now, parenthetically, as an example of Russia's unique strength, its vast size far from Europe's center, the fact that it lost the Crimean War had little effect short-term or long-term on Russian power. And indeed, once Russia <clears throat> had signed the peace treaty in Paris, Alexander turned his attention, this time with positive results, to the Caucasus, where the Muslim Sheikh Shamil had been nipping at Russia's heels for two decades. And within a few years, Alexander had annexed the Northern Caucasus and was finally free to deal with his main domestic focus, freeing the serfs. Obviously, the landowners were against any emancipation, and the state council, which was made up of the key members of Russia's nobility, did its best to delay the process. But finally, fed up with their foot dragging, and this was the end of January 1861, five years into his reign, Alexander issued an ultimatum. I consider the emancipation of the slaves to be a vital question for, for Russia on which the development of its strength and might will depend. I demand of the State Council that the serf question be completed in the first half of February. Now, Alexander had come up with a rather ingenious plan. The Russian government would buy the serfs from their owners. And since, as I said earlier, serfs were regularly bought and sold on the open market, their value was clearly established. And Alexander offered above market rates to the landowners, financing the deals with bonds put up by the French government. He then arranged to pay off the bonds by charging the serfs for their freedom, obviously to be paid off over a period of time. The state council accepted the inevitable, though they did manage to reduce the amount of land Alexander intended to allocate to the free serfs. Expecting trouble, Troops were on alert throughout Russia the day the proclamation was issued, which, as I said, was March 3, 1861. Surprisingly, it was received with calm and indeed generated enormous praise from radicals who were against, against the regime. Alexander Herzen, at the time he was the most famous Russian uh, liberal, he'd been forced into exile in London. He praised Alexander profusely, from the distance of our exile, we hail Alexander with a name rarely encountered in autocracy. We hail him with the name Liberator. And Prince Kropotkin, he was a future leader of the anarchist movement, was to recall, my feeling then was that if someone had made an attempt on Alexander's life, I would have shielded him with my own chest. But if, Ele if Russia's radicals and future anarchists were pleased with Alexander's action, they were, in fact, in the minority. The nobility and landowners, the retrogrades, as they were to be called, were, of course, the most unhappy. They had lost the most. But even the serfs, surprisingly, were not that happy. The plots they received individually were, were minuscule, and the costs seemed much too high. And student agitators were naturally delighted to stir things up. Peasant uprisings followed which were, of course, put down by force, which naturally provoked further student outrage. 
The students, ironically but hardly surprisingly, they were for the most part the sons of the retrogrades, of the landowners, of the nobility. They took as their manifesto a line from a well-known Russian poet, enough rejoicing, it's time to move forward. The people are free, but are they happy? Alexander was to comment at the time, no doubt wistfully, that the only cure for freedom is more freedom. The following spring, a group which called itself Young Russia issued a proclamation. There is only one way out of this oppressive situation. Revolution, revolution, bloody and inexorable. Revolution that must radically change everything, everything without exception. As you can see, the door had been open or, or any way cracked. Ferment, which had been suppressed in Russia for decades, for centuries, was erupting. We interrupt this program to bring you uh, a disturbing note from uh, Russia. There are anarchists in our midst. Uh, the, the word anarchist has not been used until the middle of the 19th century, so let me explain what I mean. Anarchists are people who honestly believe that government is inherently evil, uh, that mankind's unhappiness does not reside in this or that form of government, but in the very principle of government itself. Um, if there is a state, there is slavery. The state without slavery uh, is unthinkable. This man, Mikhail Bakunin, recently escaped from Siberia, uh, is uh, spreading this kind of drivel uh, around all of Russia. Uh, and this man recently escaped from the Peter and Paul Fortress uh, in St. Petersburg, a one-time uh, aristocrat, uh, is saying the same sort of thing. Anarchism is society without government. Imagine that. Uh, there are even anarchist groups uh, and this group, Narodnaya Volya, uh, would actually consider assassinating our czar. We remind our audience that the czar's legitimacy does not come from man, but from God. Keep that in mind. Um, be on the lookout for these men. Uh, they are armed with frightening and dangerous ideas. And now back to you, Mac. And they are indeed armed with dangerous and frightening ideas, which lead... Now, in retrospect, it seemed almost inevitable to Alexander's assassination. As his most famous Russian biographer has written, once Alexander quickened Russia's pulse, he could not contain its circulation. The first attempt on Alexander's life came in the early spring of 1866 as he was taking a walk in the summer garden, one he took every day at the same time with hardly any protection. The would-be assassin, not surprisingly, the son of an aristocrat, shot at the czar and missed. <laughs> Dostoevsky, whose crime and punishment was in fact appearing in monthly installments in Russia's foremost literary magazine at that same time, burst into the apartment of a friend later that same day. They shot at the czar, Dostoevsky shouted. Did they kill him, his friend asked? No, but they shot at him, and he kept repeating, they shot at him, they shot at him, they shot. Dostoevsky understood, and an historian was later to write, that despite the miss, the shot had been a hit. Before, czars had been assassinated secretly in palace coups, where they were said to have died of a stroke or a heart attack. Now, <clears throat> someone had taken a shot at the czar in public, shattering the previously inviolable aura of the sacred person it was the Russian czar. Five more assassination attempts were to be made against Alexander. The second came on a state visit to Paris the following year. Incidentally, during that, that same visit to Paris, while on a walk in the Tuileries Garden, Alexander had his palm read by a gypsy. She told him he would survive six attempts on his life, but not the seventh. As we shall see, the gypsy was only off by one. <clears throat> The next day, Alexander was riding in a carriage with Napoleon III when a Polish emigre shot at him at close range. Mercifully for Alexander, the would-be assassin had overloaded the gunpowder in his pistol, which then exploded. The rest of the <clears throat> decade actually passed peacefully for Alexander. The next attempt on his life wasn't until April 1879, when a former university student, naturally from a landed family, and a member of that of, of a different revolutionary group, actually. It was called Land and Freedom. And he confronted the Tsar as he was out on his daily walk around the Winter Palace. 
His first shot, that's the article in the, in the, uh, in the New York Times about it, his first shot <clears throat> from two paces away missed. <laughs> Alexander took off running in a zigzag fashion while his assailant got off four more shots, all of which missed. The Tsar, as he had after pass attempts, celebrated his escape with a mass in the cathedral, its bells ringing joyously. A joke supposedly making the rounds of the time, a janitor, hearing the cathedral's bells pealing in the middle of a weekday afternoon, remarks, ah, they missed again. <laughs> Six months later, another revolutionary group, this is the one that Tom had mentioned earlier, <coughs> Narodnaya Volya, the People's Will, attempted to blow up the Tsar's train when he was en route to Moscow. Again, luck was on the Tsar's side. As his train had had to stop unexpectedly at the previous station, the revolutionaries blew up the wrong train. <laughs> A few months after that, the same group, Narodnaya Volya, tunneled under the dining room of the Winter Palace. They set off a massive explosion. It killed 11 and wounded 30. Once again, the Tsar repeated, God had protected him. Actually, this time it was his nephew, the Prince of Bulgaria, who had protected him. He had arrived late for dinner that evening, so the dining room was still empty when the bomb went off. But Alexander's luck finally ran out a year later when three members of the same group, Narodnaya Volya, were lined up along the Tsar's regular Sunday carriage route. The first threw his bomb under the Tsar's, uh, the Tsar's carriage, and while it went off, it only slightly damaged the carriage. The carriage itself had been a gift from Napoleon III and was bomb-proof. But Alexander impulsively and mistakenly got out to assess the damage. And before he could be hustled back to the palace, the second bomber, a 24-year-old aristocrat, naturally, tossed his bomb directly at Alexander. It was alleged the assassin shouted, it's too early for you to thank God this time. It was over. That's Alexander III, the new czar, standing above his father's body. It was March 10th, 1881, almost 20 years to the day that Alexander had freed Russia's serfs and it inadvertently opened the revolutionary floodgates. There are clearly, by mid-century, anar an anarchist movement, an anarchist movement that uh, is empowered by one particular thing. Uh, in that day, government is of, by, and for the rich. Uh, and let me give you an example of this. Uh, the action of Tolstoy's novel, Anna Karenina, takes place during the reign uh, of the Tsar uh, Alexander. Uh, and all of the characters, maybe coincidentally, all of the characters uh, are on the government payroll. Uh, Karenin, who's Anna's husband, is a minister. Uh, Oblonsky is a commissioner. Prince Sherbatsky is a special advisor to the, to the Tsar. Vronsky is the son uh, of a field marshal. And yet, they live a life of the most extraordinary luxury. Their concerns are nothing except jewelry and fashion, uh, scandals and gossip, uh, parties and affairs, and, uh, and uh, fancy dress balls, champagne uh, and caviar, uh, and all of, uh, oh, and of course adultery, uh, and all of this, all of this uh, in what is at the time the poorest nation uh, in all of Europe. Uh, not a single one of them has any material want. Well, uh, the other parties of the left, the liberals, the social democrats, the socialists, even the communists, uh, believe that government can be reformed. Uh, but the anarchists don't believe that. They believe uh, that government is inherently evil uh, and needs to be overthrown and replaced with a self-regulating uh, worker's paradise. Um, the, the early uh, anarchists are uh, largely Russian. Uh, but there, uh, there are some uh, in other nations, for instance, uh, Proudhon uh, in France, uh, or this guy uh, who would have been uh, considered uh, an anarchist in 19th century <laughs> Russia. Um, the, anarchists, the anarchists suffer. The anarchists suffer from two flaws. The first of them is 
uh, their spokesmen are continually getting off message. You know, so sometimes they sound like anarchists, but sometimes they sound like syndicalists or communists, or uh, sometimes they just sound like atheists. The first revolt is against the tyranny of theology. Uh, as long as we have a master in heaven, we will be slaves on earth. Or radical feminists. Uh, Emil Goldman uh, becomes an icon of the fem feminist movement, even in the United States, right up into uh, the 1960s. Uh, so that's the first flaw they've got. They're, they're off message quite a lot. Nonetheless, they managed to pull off between 1870 and the outbreak of the war uh, a dozen assassinations, anarchist assassinations of major uh, political figures or heads of state, including uh, President McKinley, who was assassinated in this country uh, by an anarchist. Uh, they killed the president of France, Carnot, for instance. Uh, all of these, uh, all of these uh, revolutionary events, these assassinations, have no effect whatsoever. Uh, that Carnot was killed by an, an, a, an anarchist is in no way different from what the situation would have been uh, if he died of cancer. Uh, you know, he, people, people who liked him mourn him, uh, he's replaced, and the system goes on uh, as before. Uh, it never is replaced. No, 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 what doesn't ever materialize is the self-regulating uh, people's, uh, self people's uh, workers' paradise. Alexander Hertzen uh, has a reason for this. He says, for a revolutionary event to cause a sea change, you need a plan, you need strategy, you need leaders, you need somebody to give instruction and other people to follow it. All these things are antithetical to the Russians. So uh, they can't do it. Uh, nobody is more aware of this than Bakunin. Bakunin becomes depressed toward the end of his life uh, because he can see that he's been sailing, he thought, all of his life toward uh, this notion of a self-regulating uh, self-regulating uh, workers' paradise, uh, and it never uh, pops up on the horizon. Uh, and Hertzen uh, has the very sad observation about Bakunin. He died a Columbus uh, without America. Uh, the whole revolutionary, the whole anarchist movement is dead uh, by the time of the outbreak of the war. So why, are we, why bother to talk about it? Well, because of one anarchist. His name uh, is Alexander Ilyich Ulyanov. Uh, and he pulls off on March 1st, 1887, the most amateurish, the most incompetent attempt at assassinating uh, a world leader. They try to kill Alexander III. His group uh, is tracked, infiltrated, betrayed, arrested, tried, convicted, and hanged. Uh, he is a complete, uh, the bombs he makes with his own hands, he's a chemical student, chemistry student, uh, fail to explode. The gun he has procured jams. Uh, he, he's a disgrace to the movement. Uh, and, but why, why do we care about him? Well, the name, Ulyanov. There's another Ulyanov in our story, same name, same patronymic. Uh, and his name is Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, or Lenin. Uh, and Alexander is his beloved older brother. Uh, they uh, live together uh, in the little town of Simbursk. Uh, and uh, Lenin is 17 when Alexander uh, is hanged. Uh, will the cause that his brother his beloved brother died for, uh, tend to shape the career of young Vladimir. Well, stay tuned. Well, if the anarchist movement had been the great internal threat to Russia, its growing external threat was clearly the new Germany, created almost single-handedly by one man, Otto von Bismarck. Coincidentally, earlier in his career, from 1859 to 1862, Bismarck had served as Prussia's ambassador to the court of Tsar Alexander II, during which time the 44-year-old Bismarck developed close friendships with both the Tsar as well as with his mother, Princess Charlotte. She, like most wives of the Tsars, had been born a German princess. Parenthetically, it's been estimated that at the time, with all the intermarriage with German nobility, the blood flowing in Alexander's veins was 90% German. In any case, in the spring of 1866, Bismarck left Russia to take up a short half-year stint as the Prussian emissary in Paris, after which he returned to Berlin where he'd been appointed minister president, which, is the, which was the, Russian equivalent, uh, the Prussian equivalent of prime minister, by the recently crowned Wilhelm I. Now, Bismarck quickly came to dominate Wilhelm and would continue to do so during the nearly 30 years that Wilhelm reigned. Uh, en route back to Berlin from France, 
Bismarck had stopped off in London, where he met for the first time Benjamin Disraeli, who at that time was the head of the Tory party, which was in opposition. Amazed by what he heard from Bismarck, Disraeli recorded it verbatim in his, uh, in his diary. This was Bismarck's extraordinarily frank comments about his political intentions. And this is Bismarck talking, I shall soon be compelled to undertake the conduct of the Prussian government. My first care will be to reorganize the army. As soon as the army shall have been brought into such a condition as to inspire respect, I shall seize the first best pretext to declare war against Austria, dissolve the German diet, subdue the minor states, and give national unity to Germany under Prussian leadership. Not just an amazing thing to confide to the head of the opposition party in Britain whom Bismarck was meeting for the first time, but even more amazing is the fact that by the end of 1870, within 10 years after victor victories over both Austria and France, as well as amongst the, the principalities, the German principalities, Bismarck had accomplished all that he had so offhandedly assured the astonished Israeli he would do, and then some. But even more important than his military victories, Bismarck created a balance of power that in effect stabilized Europe for 30 years. In 1873, he instituted the Dry Kaiserbund, the Three Emperors League, bringing together Kaiser Wilhelm, Emperor Franz Joseph, and Tsar Alexander in a treaty that would control Northern and Eastern Europe and in isolating France, guaranteed continental stability. Bismarck even managed to pull the strings in events in which Germany had played no role whatsoever. During the Russo-Turkish War in 1877 and 1878, the Russian army arrived literally at the gates of Constantinople. The Treaty of San Stefano between Russia and the Ottoman Empire formalized Russia's gains in the Balkans. But Bismarck, although at this point you remember he was tied by treaty to Russia, was concerned that Russia's gain in the region would greatly increase its influence in southeastern Europe at Germany's expense. So joining with England's prime minister, at this point Israeli had become the prime minister, uh, Bismarck engineered the Congress of Berlin later that summer, at which Russia was railroaded into returning much of what it had conquered in the war back to the Turks. So a war that the Russians had actually won ended up, because of Bismarck's intercession, as an enormous embarrassment to Tsar Alexander. The, uh, the last time we met the, this young man, he was, uh, was at his father's deathbed, March uh, 1881. Uh, he is now Tsar Alexander III. And if we could look inside his head at the moment of taking over the throne, uh, we would see uh, three burning issues. And the first of these uh, is he's worried about unrest. I mean, justly so. His, fa his father was killed by it in seven attempts. Uh, the second thing is the continuing sting uh, of the Congress of Berlin that Mac has just described. And third, a personal dislike and distrust uh, of Bismarck. His father uh, and Bismarck were very tight, uh, but Alexander III has no use for the man. Uh, he's convinced that the unrest is a direct result of the liberalism that his father uh, brought into Russia. So he decides to go the other way. Uh, and he, in particular, does not carry on with his father's plan uh, to declare a Duma, a constitutional government, which was to have been promulgated the day after Alexander's death, uh, the day after. But it, it gets buried by Alexander III. Uh, he uh, announces uh, that he is no liberal. He says, we declare our unshaken faith in the strength and justice of the autocratic power. We use the word autocrat as a, as a pejorative, but he doesn't. Uh, autocracy is a good thing in his mind which we have been called upon to preserve for the people's good. He tracks down the members of Narodnaya Volya uh, and sends them uh, to the scaffold. Uh, and the, but he doesn't stop there. He forms a secret police group called the Okrana, and they uh, crush brutal repression of unrest of all forms, student unrest, uh, social democrats, the unionists. Uh, they're all anarchists to, to Alexander's mind. If you are autocrat by the grace of God, anybody who doesn't agree with you is, by definition, uh, an anarchist. Uh, and he, he represses them uh, brutally. His distrust 
of Bismarck dates back to way before the Congress uh, of Berlin. Uh, Bismarck uh, in 1864 had just become the Prussian minister president and it, as a way of flexing his muscle, he picks off a little piece of Denmark called the Schleswig-Holstein, two uh, counties effectively of Denmark, uh, and conquers them, absorbs them uh, into Prussia. Um, the rest of Europe looks at this you know, and rolls their eyes. I mean, who cares about two little bits of Denmark? Uh, but one person uh, does care, and her name uh, is Princess Dagmar of Denmark, who happens to be the Tsarina, and she detests Bismarck. Uh, Alexander III goes to bed every night with a woman who detests Bismarck. You just know some of that has got to rub off. Um, now, the, Mack presented the idea of the Congress of Berlin as wise old Bismarck, you know, uh, taking the steps that were necessary to take in order to preserve the stability of our beloved Europe. Uh, but that's not the way the Russians see it at all, and in particular, not the way Alexander III sees it. And he was there. He fought that war. He was Tsarevich at the time, uh, and in his role as Tsarevich, he led the right flank uh, of the British, of the Russian army as it came down through Romania, crossed over the Danube under heavy, heavy Turkish fire. The Turks treated this as an existential threat. Uh, threat. They knew they were in trouble. Uh, he follows up uh, and again carries on, uh, now joined by the Bulgarians uh, as uh, Russia absorbs almost all of the uh, European holdings of the Ottoman Empire. And then they declare a treaty. The, the Ottomans give up. They acknowledge, yes, we're beat. You can have all this land. Uh, and if, if you follow the regular rules of 19th century warfare, Serbia and Bulgaria uh, should have expanded to the San, the San Stefano line. But no, no, Bismarck calls a Congress uh, and, and takes it all away. He forces, he railroads uh, Russia into uh, giving back all of their gains I mean, this is just not fair. I mean, the rules of 19th century warfare is to the victor belongs the spoils. The, uh, nobody took back Bismarck's gains when he conquered Alsace-Lorraine. They didn't call a Congress to say, oh, you can't have that. No, no, but they, but they have railroaded Russia, and Alexander is really irritated about this. Uh, to make matters worse, uh, the dry Kaiser Bund that, uh, that Mack referred to specifically guaranteed that Germany and Austria would respect, would remain neutral with respect uh, to Russia's uh, ambitions in the Straits. Uh, and that's the promise that Bismarck uh, broke. Uh, so Alexander III goes to his deathbed in uh, 1894 uh, with a continuing distrust uh, of uh, Austria and a grudge against Germany. And this is the patrimony he passes on to his son, Nicholas II. Okay, <clears throat> well, let me uh, return to my old friend, Otto von Bismarck, uh, a little older than when you last saw him. <clears throat> now, Bismarck's great triumph, as I mentioned, in the nearly three decades when he ruled the modern Germany that he had, after all, created, was in maintaining a balance of power that kept Europe out of major wars and not, incidentally, permitted Germany to thrive. Unlike most of his European counterparts at the time, Bismarck was well aware of just how fragile Europe was. In 1878, at, at his Congress of Berlin, he had famously commented that Europe today is a powder keg. Its leaders are like men smoking in an arsenal. A single spark will set off an explosion that will consume us all. Bismarck was a man of, of great contradictions, the Iron Chancellor, as he was known, a man of iron will, surely, but the man who had, at the very beginning of his political rule in 1863, created an early version of Social Security and instituted universal suffrage in Germany, the first country in Europe to do so. Uh, universal suffrage, certainly a basic element of democracy, but Bismarck, Bismarck after creating it, assured that democracy did not flourish in Germany. On the international front, he was the 19th century's master practitioner of realpolitik. Though his success in the end turned out to be something of a Faustian bargain, the achievement, uh, one could fairly say, of creating a modern state 
but a state that he left unprepared for the challenges that developed when the mercurial, immature Kaiser Wilhelm II took the throne in 1888. During the elder Wilhelm's reign, <clears throat> as a tool Bismarck quickly discovered he could use to get his way, he repeatedly offered his resignation, which he knew Wilhelm would always promptly reject. In March 1890, trying to manipulate the young Wilhelm, then in his second year as Kaiser, the way he had manipulated the first Wilhelm, Bismarck sent in a letter of resignation. Unfortunately, it was promptly accepted. <laughs> Max Weber, the famous German author, he wrote The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, described the legacy of Bismarck in the following terms. He left a nation totally without political education, totally bereft of political will, accustomed to expect that the great man at the top would provide their politics for them, a nation that had grown accustomed to submit patiently and fatalistically to whatever was decided for it. Sir Edward Gray, and he was Great Britain's Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs in the early 1890s <clears throat> when Bismarck was fired, compared Germany at that moment to a huge battleship without a rudder. Bismarck had prepared no one to succeed him. With him gone, no one knew how to steer the now enormous German ship of state. Germany was a nation that had grown dramatically under Bismarck's leadership. No one could have foreseen that the rump Prussian state he took charge of in 18, well, in 1862, I'll take that back. No one but Bismarck could have foreseen that it would develop in less than 30 years to dominate Central Europe with its heavy industries, uh, its advanced technological institutes, skilled, literate, increasingly urban workforce. By 1890, Germany had Europe's best army, its second largest navy, only Great Britain had a larger one, a huge trade surplus, and an archaic government of country squires run by one man. All the while, that one man, Bismarck, was working to keep France and Russia from joining together in a hostile alliance against Germany. Some historians have accused Bismarck of creating a system of, of alliances that was ultimately too complex, a system that no one could manage but himself. I must say, it does look complex. Perhaps, but Bismarck's balance of power approach was nothing if not rational. The structure of treaties he created during the 1870s and 1880s was designed to maintain peace between the Austrians and the Russians. A war between the two, he rightly feared, would envelop the continent. At the same time, Bismarck had to assure that neither Russia nor Austria would ally themselves with France in a war of revenge against Germany. Bismarck's carefully executed diplomacy worked well enough for many years, for three decades. But ultimately, the growth of Russian nationalism, the resurgence of France's military strength, and particularly the continuing instability in the Balkans taxed even Bismarck's talents. He was to predict the year before he died, when the great war comes, it will be some damn fool business in the Balkan that sets it off. Even under the best of circumstances, it would have been difficult to maintain the stability Bismarck had created. The ascension of Kaiser Wilhelm II and the departure of Bismarck were decidedly not the best of circumstances. It was certainly not what Europe needed at the time. And as Tom will tell you, Russia and France lost little time in reacting to it. The, the 1894 alliance that Russia and France form uh, is what uh, the, uh, the diplomatic historian uh, George F. Kennan called the fateful alliance because he believed that once that alliance was in place, uh, the odds of a, a conflagration happening were uh, greatly increased. Uh, how endlessly unfortunate was the involvement of Russia through her uh, ties uh, to France. It was largely this involvement that caused what had begun in 1914 as a Balkan quarrel, a mere Balkan quarrel, to grow into the dimensions of a general uh, European war. Let me tell you about that alliance between Russia and uh, yeah. and France, but I want to put it into the context of all the other, because there's a system of alliances. Uh, so here we are uh, at the end of the 19th century, the Dreikaiser Bund, 
uh, that uh, Mac referred to, Germany, Austria, uh, and Russia. But, but uh, uh, Russia drops out uh, in 1879 because Bismarck has violated the terms uh, of the Dreikaiser Bund. Uh, and so now you've got a situation uh, that Bismarck uh, found scary. Uh, he uh, needed to add uh, a little bit of uh, strength by incorporating uh, Italy into what they called the Triple Alliance, but he's still worried that France has no dar dancing partner, Russia has no dancing partner. What would happen if they'd get together? So he quickly forms an alliance, a, a secret alliance with Russia uh, that's called uh, the 1887 Reinsurance Treaty. And at this point, he's doing what I call the Bismarckian two-step. He's got a secret alliance uh, with Russia and a secret alliance uh, with Austria and uh, Italy, uh, and neither of the other treaty partners knows about uh, his uh, two-step. When Wilhelm takes over and Bismarck is fired, uh, Wilhelm refuses to renew the reinsurance treaty. Uh, and now we have the situation uh, that Bismarck feared, uh, France and Russia without dancing partners. And sure enough, uh, in 1894, uh, they formed the uh, Franco-Russian alliance. And then there are two more quick alliances, uh, and uh, what you have uh, is the uh, playbook for the beginning uh, of the 1914 games. Uh, in order to understand what uh, Kennan's point was, imagine that Russia had not gone into that alliance. So let's take Russia out. Uh, and now, given that there is a, uh, a flashpoint in the Balkans, that's Serbia, uh, what would happen? Well, you can see just by staring at the map that that France cannot attack Austria. It has no border with Austria. It can hardly attack Germany and take on the might of the Triple Alliance uh, in order to get at Austria because that wouldn't be uh, acceptable to uh, the Republic. Uh, they have a, a democratic republic at this point. Uh, Russia, similarly, uh, is unlikely to attack all three of the members of the Triple, triple Alliance, uh, and it might, it might well have become, uh, as uh, Kennan foretold, just a Balkan quarrel. So his thought is that the First World War might, but for this alliance, if they hadn't entered into the alliance, the First World War might not have happened right then. Not to say it might never have happened, but not right then. But they did form this alliance. Now, how did that happen? Why did they form the alliance? I mean, it's clear that that was not uh, a great idea. You need to look at the negotiating team. Under Alexander III, there are uh, two major players. There is the diplomat, that's Nikolai Gears, a genius. Uh, Alexander is completely dependent on him. Uh, and the military man, uh, Peter Vanofsky. Uh, and each of these has a slightly different role in, in negotiating a treaty. The military guy, his job is assume war is inevitable, first of all. By the way, when a military person tells you war is inevitable, uh, your knee-jerk reaction, reaction ought to be, yeah, of course you believe that. You're paid to believe that. That's your job to believe that. So he's obliged to believe that war is inevitable and then do whatever he can uh, to figure out how to win it. Uh, the, the diplomat has a completely different contrary role, which is to assume that war is not inevitable and do whatever he can to make sure it doesn't happen. Now, what happens if one of the two parties cannot fulfill its function? If one of the two parties goes into eclipse, as Gears does, he's elderly, he's on his deathbed, he can't write, he, he does the negotiation from in bed. People have to come to him to negotiate, uh, and he loses uh, his... He loses his control of his half of the equation. Uh, on one day, on July 16, uh, 1891, uh, Gears, on his sick bed, uh, is parleying uh, with La Boulay, his, uh, his French counterpart. And that same day, unknown to the two diplomats, uh, in La Dordogne, in France, uh, the chief of staff of the Russian uh, army and the chief of staff of the French army are, are negotiating, completely unknown to the diplomats. So what we get is not one alliance, but two. There's a diplomatic alliance uh, formed by the statesmen, and there's a military convention, and the military convention is where the problem is. Let's take a look at that. Gears would never have allowed this uh, to happen if he'd been involved. Uh, the first clause is pretty straightforward. It's just mutual defense. Any, any defense uh, treaty would have that. If they attack you, we'll help. If they, if they attack us, you help us. Uh, just a, no, nothing to object to there. But the second clause is not typical of a defense alliance. It's more like an offense alliance. It says, 
In case the forces of the Triple Alliance or any one of the powers belonging to it should be mobilized, France and Russia shall mobilize immediately and simultaneously the whole of their forces and shall transport them as far as possible uh, to their borders. Any one of the powers, Italy, if Italy mobilizes, and you've got to ask, against whom are they going to mobilize that cause France and Russia to? Suppose they mobilize against Ethiopia. This actually happens later on uh, in the 30s. Then France and Russia are obliged to mobilize immediately and march on Germany? I mean, no wonder the diplomats would have had a kitten over this because it tied Russia's hands to act in a way that wasn't going to be in its best, uh, in its best interest. The available forces to be applied against Germany. Who cares? You know, Ethiopia, you know, Italy, applied against Germany. Only against Germany. And worst of all, all the clauses enumerated above shall be kept absolutely secret. Uh, Kennan asserts that fewer than 10 people knew of the military convention, that the diplomats, the diplomatic corps of neither France nor Russia would ever have allowed it to happen uh, if they had been involved. Um, it never would have passed muster. Yeah, so, so as, as Tom has explained, uh, George Kennan thought the Franco-Russian alliance was an early step down the path to World War I. Now, you know, who can know for sure? But surely a big part of the problem was that the self-confident, experienced Tsar Alexander III died suddenly at age 49 uh, at the end of 1894, just a few months after he and the French had finalized their alliance and was replaced by his inexperienced son, the 26-year-old Nicholas II. His father had done literally nothing to prepare him for the job. Indeed, the old Tsar had so little confidence in his son, and it's hard to believe he was just following uh, that secrecy clause of the alliance to the letter, that when Nicholas ascended to the throne, he had absolutely no knowledge of the Franco-Russian alliance that his father had signed only a few months earlier. Uh, just before he died, in a conversation with one of his ministers, Alexander had described Nicholas, or Nicky, that's what his older cousin, Germany's Emperor Wilhelm, called him, as nothing but a boy whose judgments are childish. Now, poor Nicholas was well aware of how unprepared he was to take over the autocratic throne of late 19th century Russia. Confessing to his foreign minister shortly after he became the Tsar, I know nothing. The late emperor did not foresee his death and did not let me in on his government business. His reign had begun on a particularly ill-omened note. The tradition had long been that a few days after the coronation of the new Tsar in St. Petersburg, public festivities would be held at a place called Kadinka Field, which was on the outskirts of Moscow. Over half a million people showed up. Unfortunately, the police had been unprepared for the large numbers coming to see the new czar. Something caused the crowd to panic, and over 1,500 people were killed in the ensuing stampede. Bad enough, but the clueless czar made it worse by attending an extravagant ball given by the French ambassador that same night. So the first image the public had of the new czar was, him, uh, was of him dancing and drinking champagne late into the night of the very day the incompetence of his own government had caused the death of more than a thousand of his loyal subjects. Now that was an image that Nicholas was never going to erase. If the coronation was a low point in Nicholas's uh, reign, uh, a high point comes very shortly after that, at least in my opinion a high point, uh, and that is the uh, Hague Arms Limitation Conference uh, of 1899. Now, this is a subject that Mac and I couldn't come to an agreement on. Uh, we agree what happened, but as to its significance, I think it was highly significant, uh, and Mac, Mac thinks not. Uh, and so we thought we would both stand up here and, and tell you the two sides of this, and you could decide for yourself. Now, the, 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 the Hague Conference uh, <clears throat> was launched just two years after Nicholas's uh, disastrous coronation. I think, as likely as not, it was an effort by him to make his mark, uh, not just as ruler of Russia, but as would-be international statesman. So he issues a decree, uh, the Tsar's rescript, as it was called, for a worldwide disarmament, disarmament conference to, quote, study the most effective means of ensuring for all peoples 
a real and lasting peace, and in particular to put an end to the progressive development of existing armaments. As Tom said, we disagree on the importance of the Young Czar's initiative. I accept that it was seen as a big deal, uh, but only, I'm afraid, by a vanishingly small number of peaceniks and liberal do-gooders. Well, I, everybody in this room knows that Nicholas turns out to be uh, spineless and clueless, but uh, that's a different Nicholas. That's this guy. Uh, the young Nicholas is a total unknown in Europe. Uh, he's only been on a throne for a few years. Uh, people are willing to expect good things of him. Uh, and the words of the rescript uh, ring very true to most people. The arms race is transforming the armed peace into a crushing burden that weighs on all nations and, if prolonged, will lead inevitably to the very cataclysm which is it, it is desired uh, to avert. People hearing this relate to the phrase crushing burden because they are bearing the crushing burden. It has two forms, taxation and conscription. Taxation, in Germany alone, 90% of the budget, which is paid for by the taxes, uh, is used for the military. And in Europe in those days, uh, general conscription was everywhere except England. Uh, so uh, not only do we have to pay for this ridiculous arms race, uh, but uh, when the cataclysm ine inevitably comes, we have to fight the battle. Uh, so uh, people are against it. Uh, the, the president of the Congress, uh, in opening the Congress, uh, the Baron de Stahl uh, uh, picks up the theme of Nicholas's uh, words. Armed peace today causes more considerable expense than the most burdensome war uh, of former times. Yeah, so, so uh, as I said, it sounded like a noble enterprise. Disarmament always does. But the fact is, the important fact is, that it was met with a mixture of, at best, amused condescension, and worse, outright contempt by the governments of the key European countries. By the governments, yes, but how about the people? I mean, this was big news. Uh, when it came out, uh, it was treated in virtually every newspaper in the United States and all the rest of Europe. Uh, it's easier to get the American one, so I don't have uh, so many European ones. So this is Los Angeles, uh, Washington, St. Paul, um, Astoria, little towns, Astoria, Oregon, um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, Lewiston, Maine. It's big news because people are the ones who are bearing the burden, the crushing burden, taxation, uh, and conscription. Uh, yeah, and of course the Tsar had framed the conference in idealistic uh, humanitarian terms, but its key purpose, uh, from the Russian point of view, as Tom has admitted, was to contain the economic consequences of keeping up with the developing European arms race. Although the last years of his father Alexander's reign had indeed been seen unprecedented uh, industrial growth in Russia, Russia's economy still lagged far behind that of its neighbors. Now, notwithstanding the cynical view uh, the big countries of Europe had towards Nicholas's uh, proposed conference, and no doubt swayed by that favorable public opinion that so impresses Tom, 108 delegates from 26 countries, including the United States and Japan, accepted the Tsar's invitation and met in The Hague in an idyllic setting at a place called Wies ten Bosch, House of the Woods, the summer palace of the Queen of the Netherlands. It was May 18, 1899, which not coincidentally was the Tsar's 31st birthday. Most of the delegations were headed by experienced diplomats and military experts. And as I said, the mood amongst them was anything but optimistic. The US delegation, uh, that's a picture of the delegation. It was headed by Andrew White. Uh, he had been a, 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 the former uh, American ambassador to Russia. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm informed by its most prominent Maine alumnus. He was the founder of Cornell University. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, an observation in White's diary reflected the widespread negative view of the cognoscenti. Probably since the world began, never has so large a body come together in a spirit of more hopeless skepticism. <laughs> and despite all those small town newspapers, Tom quoted, some more sophisticated ones like the Minneapolis Journal had a pretty jaundiced view of the whole thing as well. 
sophisticated in Minneapolis are not two words that I typically put together, but <laughs> um, people are calling uh, for meetings uh, throughout the uh, developed world, uh, meetings to uh, send a message, uh, simultaneous meetings on May 15th, to send a message uh, to the delegates. Uh, and many of the groups uh, that are meeting uh, form petitions, uh, for instance this one, uh, and carry those petitions to the delegates. The petitions say, get on with it. Make good on the Tsar's promise and limit the uh, production of arms. Uh, there are 750 resolutions from England alone, public resolutions. Belgium sent a petition with 100,000 signatures, uh, and the Netherlands one with nearly a quarter million uh, signatures. Now, notwithstanding uh, the women and their petitions, in the real world, as I've said, the big power delegates were to a man, and they were all men, extremely cynical about the Tsar's pet project. The Germans took the lead in pointing out the difficulties of arms control, opposing any limitation, much less reduction of a nation's arms, and the French were just as opposed. The head of their delegation, a guy named Léon Bourgeois, privately told his German counterpart that, quote, we know that you do not wish to limit your power of defense, nor to have anything to do with proposals for disarmament. We are in exactly the same position. But, Bourgeois added, unfortunately, it was necessary to consider European public opinion, which he, quote, had to admit, had been greatly excited by this ill-conceived Russian initiative. John Hay, and he was our Secretary of State at the time, he thought the Tsar's proposals were, quote, lacking in credibility and that the conference was likely to do more harm than good. The British War Office was also adamantly opposed, believing it is undesirable to assent to an international code on the laws and evolution of war. Yes, the big countries, the big country uh, delegations were against it, but uh, the smaller countries had a different tale to tell. For instance, the Bulgaria, uh, the head delegate from Bulgaria was uh, Dr. Dmitry Stanchov, uh, and he said very eloquently, an armed peace is ruinous for small states whose needs are numerous and who have everything to gain by investing their means in the development of industry and agriculture and the requisites of progress. In any case, and the Bulgarians and, and their ilk notwithstanding, after two months of diplomatic hand-wringing in the Dutch countryside, the best that the world's leading nations could do was to adopt unanimously the innocuous revolution that, quote, the conferences of the opinion that the restriction of military budgets is extremely desirable for the increase of the moral welfare of mankind. Now, exactly how to accomplish this was, of course, above their pay grade or, more likely, just beneath their contempt. You see, what I think is important here is that the Congress uh, is an illustration of the, the disastrous divergence between the interests of the governed and the interest of their governors. The governed wanted to limit arms. They didn't want to pay the taxes. They didn't want conscription. They wanted peace. There is peace in 1899. Why muck with that? Why introduce change that can only lead us toward cataclysm? Uh, in order to make that idea, the divergence between the governed and the governments uh, who are stuck in this uh, addiction to an arms race, uh, I wanted to uh, have a symbol for you, something to make it stick in your mind. And I've chosen uh, a British recruiting song from a little bit later, uh, 1915, uh, that I, I think sums it up. So take a look. Oh, we don't want to lose you, but we think you ought to go for your king and your country. We think you ought to go. Who's the we and the you here? The we is the government, and the you are the poor bastards that are going to get sent off to get slaughtered at the Battle of the Somme. Uh, now, incidentally, as you can imagine, in the preparation for this talk, I've seen that video more than a few times. 
And for the life of me, I can't figure out why those British dance hall girls were carrying lacrosse sticks. <laughs> but anyway, uh, back to the Hague Conference. If it had seemed like an inspired idea, at least, as I said, to the liberals and naifs of the day, it was clear from the results it did not enhance the reputation of the young czar, Nicholas II. But to be fair, what could have? Ruling Nicholas's Russia wouldn't have been easy for even the most experienced of leaders. Russia's population had exploded in the second half of the 19th century, doubling from 67 million in 1861, that was the year the serfs were freed, to 135 million by 1900. The majority of the growth came in the rural districts of European Russia, where it was estimated that the average peasant's income in the area around Moscow was between 60 to $70, and that's per year. It meant that most peasants had to hire themselves out to rich landowners, in fact, reverting uh, to semi-serf status. And remember that uh, they had been freed now for four decades, but most were worse off economically than they had been when owned, but at least provided for by rich landowners. Not surprisingly, such economic hardships encouraged rebellious behavior. European travelers who 100 years earlier had described Russia's peasants as naturally gay and good-natured <laughs> depicted them by 1900 as sullen and hostile. The intelligentsia, and, and not just the students, were also acting up. A group of liberal intellectuals created an organization called the Union of Liberation which was demanding a constitution. And so too was the new working class. An orthodox priest, that's Father Capon, had created a workers' movement that led a huge but peaceful demonstration to the Winter Palace in January of 1905, seeking radical political reform, specifically the creation of a constituent assembly. The czar, or at least his advisors, were caught off guard and rather than use the old-fashioned cavalry to ride into the mob with whips and sabers, which uh, was effective but seldom fatal, they called out the infantry who opened fire. Bloody Sunday, it was called. Over 100 were killed and many times that wounded. So 19, this was January 1905, and 1905 was off to a bad start and was only to get worse for Nicholas. He had let himself get sucked into a war with Japan believing the much larger and he assumed more powerful Russia would easily win. The Japanese are infidels, he said. The might of holy Russia will crush them. Public opinion in his own was confident in the risk of war. So, at this point, with his Far East fleet bottled up in Port Arthur by the Japanese Navy, Nicholas ordered his European Navy to Asia. It took his Baltic fleet six months to reach the coast of Japan, only to be wiped out in a single day right after they arrived. All 11 of its battleships sent to the bottom of the Japan Sea. And meanwhile, its army suffered a major defeat at Mukden in Far East uh, Ru Russia almost simultaneously. The Grand Marshal of the court, a fellow named Count Benkendorf, was to write after Japan's victory that Russia had become at best, a second-rate power for two generations. His anger at Nicholas was palpable. Calling him ridiculous, he added that he was beginning to annoy everyone. Mm -hmm. Strikes and uprisings were spreading. The peasantry, sensing the government's vulnerability, attacked landowners', landowners estates, burned houses, destroyed crops. Even the senior regiment of the Russian army mutinied. At the end of October, under increasing pressure and with his prestige at an all-time low, Nicholas agreed to the creation of Russia's first elected assembly, the State Duma. The key provision in this law was that without the Duma's approval, no law could be put into effect. Nicholas opened this first step into a form of Russian democracy with an impressive ceremony at the Winter Palace. Nicholas could still do pomp and circumstance quite well. But this was a truly monumental event. The autocratic czar was sharing power with the people. At least 
so the monarchy had survived. Revolution had been avoided, for the moment, anyway. Lenin is a man with a plan. Uh, his revolution is going to stick because he has developed a credible vision uh, for what to put in place of the government that he's going to overthrow. Uh, that vision, the invention, Lenin's invention of practical communism, uh, consists of uh, the April Theses, the what is to be done, the dialectic materialism, vitally important stuff, but also deeply dull. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. Uh, what I want to do instead uh, is tell you about the man's uh, adventurous life. Uh, he's born in 1870 uh, in the little town of Simbursk on the Volga. Uh, and immediately, he's 17 at the time of his brother's hanging. Uh, he reports that, that uh, fall uh, to the University of Kazan, where he's accepted. He's almost immediately expelled uh, for political shenanigans. Uh, and he continues to study. He's not allowed to sit in classes, but he, he is allowed to sit for exams, uh, which he does in St. Petersburg uh, in May uh, of 1890. Uh, and he is accepted in the bar, to the bar. He gets a law degree, and he becomes a lawyer. Now, I didn't know this before I... Uh, started to research this. Did you know this, that Lenin was a lawyer, practiced for seven years uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, still carrying on with his revolutionary activity, trying to over overthrow the government. So he's half-time uh, criminal lawyer, half-time criminal. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's kind of better call Saul for the 19th century. Uh, finally, the, uh, in 1897, uh, uh, the authorities uh, get wind of this, uh, they arrest him, uh, and without benefit of trial, they ship him off uh, to uh, Siberia, to the little town of Shushkin, uh, Shushinkoya. Uh, meanwhile, his girlfriend has also been arrested. Her name is Nadezhda Krupskaya. Uh, she's been arrested for something totally different. She's uh, organizing uh, labor strikes. She's been imprisoned, uh, and she's about to get sent off to uh, Siberia, but she weaves this wonderful fantasy for the authorities. She's, she says that she and Lenin are engaged to be married. It's not true, uh, but she says it, and she sheds a tear at exactly the right moment. Uh, and the authorities relent, and they send her off to join Lenin uh, in Shushinkoya. Uh, and uh, sure enough, in July of 1898, they are married. Now, this is a little out of, out of sequence, but they have a great marriage. They make a great marriage. They are uh, lovers, faithful lovers through the rest of their lives, uh, best friends, uh, partners in the business uh, of uh, revolution uh, and constant companions uh, all the way from their university days uh, until Lenin's death in 1924. It's hard to make a revolution uh, that uh, transforms the world, but it's even harder to make a great marriage, uh, as we all know. <laughs> uh, when they come back uh, from uh, Siberia after their three years are up, they settle in the little town of Peskov, uh, on the Estonian border, under the watchful eyes of the police, uh, and they just can't take it. So they, they move on uh, to greener pastures, first to, uh, to Zurich, uh, and then eventually to Munich. Now, Lenin's still a young man at this point, uh, and he uh, founds a, a journal, which will, he will uh, keep going for the rest of, uh, most of the rest of this story. The journal is called Iskra, or the spark, the spark of revolution. And this journal advocates the violent overthrow of practically everything, practically everywhere. Uh, and it makes uh, Lenin persona non grata almost everywhere he goes from now on. Um, it, this is now uh, 1905, a bloody Sunday has erupted, uh, and uh, Lenin and Krupskaya decide to make their way back, because this might be the, the revolution, uh, they make their way back uh, to St. Petersburg, uh, but it's too hot there, uh, and they have to escape from St. Petersburg uh, to Stockholm. They try to come back again uh, through Finland, uh, but the Finns, or the Finnish government, the Russian government in Finland, uh, deports them, uh, and they make their way uh, to London. London. London is a place that's uh, fairly tolerant of other people's revolutionaries. Uh, so Lenin is there uh, at the same time that uh, uh, Prince Kropotkin is there, Bakunin is there. Uh, all of the Russian revolutionaries uh, find refuge uh, in London, including Leon Trotsky. Uh, he's had an adventure of his own, escaped twice from Siberia. Uh, and he uh, comes to London where he joins Lenin, uh, serves Lenin uh, as a reporter uh, for Iskra. Uh, it's the beginning of an on-again, off-again friendship. 
uh, that takes them right through to the end, uh, right through to Lenin's deathbed, at which point he chooses Trotsky to be his, uh, his hand-picked uh, successor. Lenin goes off uh, to, from London to uh, Denmark, but he's not uh, welcome there, and then to Paris, but he's not welcome there. Uh, and then he's, now he's trying to get back closer to Russia, and he goes to Krakow, which is in the kingdom uh, of Galicia, uh, a, a, an Austrian uh, holding. Uh, and there he meets the man uh, whom he calls uh, the Marvelous Georgian. His name is uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, and they began to have a, a, a friendship and a partnership as well. Now it's wartime, uh, and the battle line is approaching uh, Galicia. It's not safe to be there anymore, so Lenin and Krupskaya uh, take off for Zurich. Uh, and they're there uh, in 1917, uh, when the February uh, Revolution breaks out. Uh, now, this is the big one, uh, and uh, they realize they need to get to St. Petersburg now. Uh, but it's not so easy to do, because in order to get back there, they can't just take a train, because that train would go across uh, nations at war and across the battle line. Uh, so they begin to negotiate with the Germans. The Germans would like to get Lenin back to St. Petersburg, because they figure uh, if his if his revolution succeeded, he might pull Russia out of the war. Uh, and so they're trying to get him back. And, and they allocate to him the famous sealed train. Uh, it's, uh, it's sealed uh, because while they want him to get to Russia, they're not in the least interested in having him uh, get off the train anywhere in Germany. That would not be good. So the sealed train goes uh, up through the middle of Germany, not uh, the war zone, uh, and it gets uh, to a ferry which carries them on to uh, Stockholm. From Stockholm they go uh, by ferry and train uh, to St. Petersburg where they arrive uh, on 16 April of 1917 to a tumultuous welcome. This is the communist uh, who has come back to lead the communist revolution. Well, not quite. It's, it's too early to, uh, to celebrate because it's not his particular flavor of communism, the Bolsheviks, uh, that are in power. It's the Mensheviks. Now, the difference between the two is completely invisible to all of, the, all of us in this room. Uh, it's like the, Suez, the Shia and the Sunnis. Uh, they hate each other, but they're identical to us. Uh, Kerensky uh, is the Menshevik, and he's in charge. Uh, and he puts out an arrest warrant for, uh, for Lenin. Lenin escapes uh, to uh, Finland, comes back again. When he comes back, he comes back in in disguise. This is Lenin with a wig. You've never seen Lenin without the bald dome, uh, but here he is uh, with forged uh, papers uh, back uh, in October of 1917, and now they are united back in St. Petersburg uh, and in charge, Stalin, Lenin, and Trotsky. Look out, world. Okay, now if, if Lenin helps make the, resolution, uh, the revolution, arguably the <coughs> charismatic Peasant priest Rasputin unwittingly provided a lot of the ammunition for the revolution. In one sense, Rasputin was a typical village priest, performing orthodox rituals with an element of mysticism, which was a normal component of peasant religion in late 19th century Russia. He was introduced to Tsarina Alexandra in November 1905, a low point that year, you remember, in the Tsar's reign, the year of Bloody Sunday, the defeat by the Japanese. And just weeks earlier, before they met uh, Rasputin, the Tsar had been forced to sign the first Duma into existence, the first uh, assembly. Indeed, <clears throat> Rasputin was no doubt the only good news the Tsar and his wife had during that disastrous year, or so it seemed. Their son, the Tsarevich Alexei, who was then just a year old, had been diagnosed with hemophilia. Miraculously, Rasputin was able, apparently with only prayers, to stop the young heir's bleeding. As the Tsar's younger sister, she was the Grand Duchess Olga, reported after witnessing one of Rasputin's many intercessions, the poor child lay in such pain, the doctors were just useless. Aliki, uh, Aliki was the Tsarina's nickname, then sent a message to Rasputin who reached the palace about midnight. Early the following morning, Aliki called me to Alexei's room. The little boy was not just alive, but well. He was sitting up in bed, the fever gone, the horror of the evening before a distant nightmare, 
Some people would have it that Rasputin's prayers were simply coincidental with my nephew's recovery. The coincidence might have happened, say, once or twice, but I cannot even count how many times it has happened. Now, <clears throat> realize the Tsar genuinely admired, even idealized, what he considered the sterling qualities of the Russian man of the soil. Now, now from, from afar, of course. In this context, Rasputin, the Siberian peasant and holy man, fit perfectly, or so it seemed. And while the relationship would boomerang against the Tsar, at least on a personal level, a majority of the Russian masses revered the Tsar, or anyway, the, the concept of the Tsar was part and parcel of Russian history. The best example of this is the celebration of the Romanov Tercentenary in 1913, 300 years of Romanov rule. The festivities began in St. Petersburg in February and concluded three months later in May when the royal family retraced the route of their ancestor, the first Romanov, Mikhail. He was a 16-year-old. He'd been a compromised choice to end what at the time in 1613 had been a de decade-long civil war. Tsar Nicholas, accompanied by his father, by his family, went by boat down the Volga to the monastery of Ipitea, where the young Mikhail had been living out the Civil War with his mother. And then, following his ancestors' footsteps, Nicholas returned to Moscow a week later to ride in triumph on a golden stallion through cheering throngs en route to the Kremlin. It was a last fleeting moment of glory for poor Nicholas, reinforcing his belief so late in his game of his eternal bond with the great Russian masses. But if Nicholas's bond with the sons and daughters of Mother Russia was personified by his and the Tsarina's close friendship and, and ultimately reliance upon the holy man, Rasputin, the mad monk, they had chosen unwisely. <clears throat> Although originally Rasputin had been introduced to the royal couple by a close family member, and as such was initially accepted by St. Petersburg society, as his influence over the royal couple grew, he became increasingly unpopular, Rasputin, in court circles where he was seen as a, a charlatan, but, but worse, as the power behind the throne. The St. Petersburg press, no doubt influenced by members of the court, attacked Rasputin as a womanizer, uh, helped, as you can see, with original research by Hollywood. Uh, but. But if Rasputin's influence over the Tsar was making him ever more unpopular at the court, he was ironically right about one thing. In a telegram he sent to the Tsar in the middle of June 1914, the middle of June, this was two weeks before the Archduke was assassinated, he perceptively warned the Tsar about the danger of a war with Germany. If Russia goes to war, it will be the end of the monarchy, the end of the Romanovs, and the end of Russian institutions. Six weeks later, Russia was at war with Germany. The following July, Nicholas decided to go to the, to the front, July of 1915, to lead his troops and act everyone at the time believed to have been suggested by Rasputin, as it left him with his mystical influence over the Tsarina, effectively in charge. A famous newspaper article by a key Duma member, this was a guy named Vasily Maklakov. Maklakov came from a distinguished Moscow family. His brother had earlier served the Tsar's interior minister. Maklakov compared Russia at the time to a vehicle with no brakes, driven down a narrow mountain path by a mad chauffeur. Hostility towards the Tsar and the Tsarina because of Rasputin was not just widespread now, worse, it was out in the open. <clears throat> there would be several unsuccessful assassination attempts against Rasputin. He was finally murdered in December 1916, just two months before the February Revolution that was to overthrow the monarchy, finish off the Romanovs, <laughs> and destroy three centuries of Russian institutions just as Rasputin had predicted. <laughs> the Balkan region had been 
um, dominated by the Balkans up through the 18th century. And through the 19th century, uh, they are in somewhat retreat until by 1900, the line uh, is here, a, a small remnant of, of European holdings. Uh, and there are some new nations and would-be nations uh, that have gotten involved. Now, everybody in the Balkans uh, has aspirations uh, to acquire somebody else's land. So let's look at what those aspirations are. What do the Serbs want? The Serbs are divided uh, into two parts. They're Serbs in Serbia and Serbs in Montenegro. And what they would like is they would like to gather this non-Serb land in between. Uh, it's called uh, the Sanjak of Novi Pasar, occupied by Muslim Bosniaks. But they would like to unite, unite themselves and thus give Serbia uh, access to the Adriatic. Uh, more than that, they would like to acquire uh, all the lands where there are Serb or Croat speakers, uh, which would be the yellow area here. Uh, the Austrians would like to thwart them by occupying the Sanjak and all of Bosnia Herzegovina, but more important than that, they would like access to the Aegean, and they have eyes on Salonika, which would involve uh, absorbing everything in between. Um, the Bulgarians just want to go back to the San Stefano line. Uh, the Greeks uh, would like everything up to Constantinople. Uh, the Russians, you learn this from your history book, would like to uh, control the Dardanelles, the Straits. Uh, but more than that, they look at these nations uh, of Slavs, uh, and they would like to form them together uh, and create a puppet government, a Slav puppet government uh, controlled from uh, Russia. Uh, they argue that Pan-Germanism gave us United Germany. Pan-Italianism uh, gave us uh, United uh, Italy. Why shouldn't Pan-Slavism uh, uh, give us uh, a United Slavic uh, Kingdom uh, in the Balkans? Well, from the viewpoint of the rest of Europe, this is a bad idea because these aren't the only Slavs. Uh, there are all these Slavs also. So, so Pan-Slavism is not popular uh, among the other European powers. Um, uh, so here we are. That's what everybody wants. How does it play out? Now hold on to your seats because there are two short wars, two assassinations, an annexation, and two mysterious behind-the-scenes figures who seem to be controlling everything. Uh, the first of these is named Dragutin Dmitrievich, or a code name Apis, and he is a Serbian military officer, the founder of the Black Hand. Uh, the very first, uh, a radical pan-Slav organization. Uh, the first thing he does is carry off uh, the assassination of the king of Serbia, Alexander I, uh, and Queen Draga. He doesn't just organize this, he actually shoots them himself. Uh, he is the, the, the trigger man. Uh, they are pro-Austrian, uh, so uh, effectively Serbia has been an Austri a kind of an Austrian puppet, uh, but when uh, Dmitrievich replaces them with King Peter uh, of Serbia, uh, it becomes uh, a Russian uh, satellite. Uh, the Austrians strike back, uh, by uh, uh, annexing uh, in um, October uh, of that same year the, uh, the Sanjak of, Bos uh, of Novi Pasar and uh, all of Bosnia, Herzegovina, without consultation with anybody. The Russians are furious. Nicholas is devastated. He says, never again will I be gulled uh, by the Austrians. Um, he appoints the most radical pan-Slav person he can find in all of Russia to be the Russian ambassador to Serbia. That man is Nicholas Hartwig, uh, and he's the second shadowy figure. He begins to travel, not just in Serbia, but Montenegro, and Bulgaria, uh, any place where there are Slav speakers. Uh, and he forms a Slav, a, 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 a Balkan League of United Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, and Montenegro. Uh, so now we've, and in a little bit of Greece. Uh, and on uh, October uh, 12th, October 8th of 1912, the Balkan League marches into Macedonia. Uh, and this is the first Balkan War. By the time it's sorted out, they have. Uh, conquered everything, virtually all of the Ottoman territories uh, in Europe. Uh, a disaster from Russia's point of view. It's, it looks like it's going to have a powerful Slav state uh, on its, from Austria's point of view, a, a powerful Slav state uh, on its doorstep. Uh, fortunately, from Austria's point of view, Bulgaria now attacks Serbia. Bulgaria attacks Serbia because they want a bigger chunk of Macedonia, uh, and now the, the Austrians are rooting for Bulgaria uh, because they're not on the doorstep. Uh, but no, uh, Serbia 
uh, wins the second Balkan War and becomes the most powerful state uh, south uh, of the Danube. Uh, in the fall of that same year, three members of the revolutionary group Miada Bosna, uh, or Young Bosnia, uh, began to plot uh, a little adventure of their own. They'd been turned down the year before by uh, Black Hand, uh, when they asked for help uh, in organizing a, a different assassination. But this time, uh, they approach uh, Dmitrievich directly, and he agrees uh, to fund them and train them uh, for what they have in mind, the assassination uh, of the uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne uh, of Austria. Chances are, Dmitrievich didn't think they could actually pull it off. But to everyone's surprise, the schoolboy plot uh, comes off almost without a hitch. Uh, and now the fat is in the fire. But the point is that this was not Pearl Harbor. Despite all the chaos, the ongoing chaos in the Balkans, war wasn't inevitable. In fact, it was more than five weeks later before the first shot was fired. Now, historians have often speculated that had Austria immediately launched a one-time retaliatory attack against Serbia, Russia would have accepted it and the disaster that was waiting for them would have been avoided. Indeed, the, Roma the Romanian prime minister at the time was to ask his Austrian counterpart, this was at the end of July, when Europe was on the precipice and they all knew it, why didn't you attack Serbia straight away and be done with it? Then you would have had the world on your side. What is Austria waiting for? What's holding them up? They've been plotting this war for the years. Uh, the, uh, the Austrian uh, chief of staff, uh, Conrad, in 1913 alone, on 25 occasions, asked for permission to start the war against Serbia. This was in the plans. And uh, now he's got his permission. What's he waiting for? As it was, within hours of the assassination, virtually all the top Austrian officials were clamoring for war. But the Prime Minister of Hungary, and you've got to remember, Hungary was the other half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Granted, it was the junior half, but the Hungarians were opposed to any military action. Uh, so th they're worried about going to war without Hungary's participation, but even more worrisome was Germany. Is Germany going to be there to protect their, uh, their, their backside against Russia? Uh, only uh, two weeks before he was assassinated, Franz Ferdinand uh, met with Wilhelm uh, in Bohemia uh, and asked him explicitly whether Austria could count uh, on uh, Germany to hold off the Russians uh, if they attacked, uh, if, they, if, the Rus if the Austrians attacked Serbia. Uh, and he writes in his diary that uh, Wilhelm dodged the question. But the assassination of the Archduke changed Wilhelm's mind, and within a week, by July 5th, the Kaiser had in effect read to back Austria if they went to war against Serbia. This was the famous blank check. Meanwhile, in Vienna, by the end of the following week, the Austrians uh, had uh, drafted an ultimatum uh, which anyone who reads it today can see that no independent state could possibly uh, agree to its terms, and they sent that to Serbia. The Austrians were finally making up their mind. They mobilized against the Serbs on July 28th, a month to the day after Franz Ferdinand had been gunned down in Sarajevo. That same day, the ever cautious Tsar uh, announces a mobilization, but no, no, not, a, not a full mobilization, a partial mobilization. And his military uh, looks at this and says, we, we've never heard of the concept of a partial mobilization. What the hell is that? Later that same day, Austria-Hungary formally declares war on Serbia. Two days later, the Tsar orders full mobilization. And later that day, rescinds that order and goes back to partial mobilization uh, before uh, conflicted and confused at the end of the day, going back uh, to full mobilization. Two days later, it's now August the 1st, the Germans declare war on Russia and begin moving their troops across the border through Luxembourg. The next day, the British uh, and the French mobilize. And the day after that, the Germans declare war on France. And the next day, we're up to August 4th, 1914. Now, Germany invades Belgium, and in response, Great Britain immediately declares war on Germany. At this point, Germany is at war with France, Russia, Great Britain, Belgium, and Luxembourg, all in support of Austria, which is at war with none of them. Well, finally, <laughs> finally, though, on August 6th, Austria declares war on France, Russia, and Great Britain. The Great War is on. Let me take it from here right through to the grisly end. Uh, the war is a disaster for the Russians. Uh, by 1916, 
they have lost 9 million dead at the front, 9 million. Uh, the temperatures uh, in St. Petersburg uh, and Moscow are at minus 30, uh, 30 below zero. Uh, soldiers at the front are being sent into battle without rifles. They're being told to pick up the rifles of their fallen comrades. Uh, the desertion rate and the casualty rate are clearly unsustainable. Uh, revolution uh, is in the works, uh, and eventually it happens. Uh, on March 2nd, 1917, uh, Nicholas is forced to abdicate. He's arrested and sent off to Tobolsk uh, in the Urals, uh, and now there's no stopping Lenin. Lenin is back. Uh, the very first thing he does is he sends a delegation to Brest-Livosk uh, in occupied German-occupied Poland to parley with the Germans. Uh, and uh, on December 12, 1917, he signs Germany out of the war. And that's the end of our story because that's the end of the march to doom. There's no more marching. Uh, the doom is upon us. We're not even going to bother uh, to tell you uh, what happens next, whether Nicholas comes back and resumes his throne as, as God intended, uh, or, or whether the war even ends. <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, of course you all know it ends. And you know what happens to poor Nicky and his family. But that's the past. What about the future? It's been almost 100 years since the Russian Revolution. Decades of Stalin and then of sclerotic Soviet leadership, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And now what? A resurgent Russia? If so, maybe we should call it back to the future, the revenge of the Romanovs. <laughs> I, I, I love that picture. <laughs> um, thanks a lot. Ah.